Hello and welcome to the QFF Business Hour, where we discuss farm business issues. Join us on the last Wednesday of each month at 4pm to engage with industry and professional business advisors to assist you in building your strategic management capacity to prepare for and manage business and climate risks, as well as improve economic, environmental and social resilience. And I wish to begin today's episode by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, seas and waters throughout Australia and pay respects to elders past, present and future. This session is made possible through the Drought Fund Farm Business Resilience Program, a jointly funded program by the Australian Government and the Queensland Drought and Climate Adaptation Program. And in this episode of the QFF Business Hour, we will identify farm financial and market risks and also discuss how to manage them effectively. All right, now I would like to welcome today's panellists. We have Daniel Elder, Queensland Rural and Industry Development Authority, as you all know, Q Rider. Hello, Daniel. How are you, Sally? Good afternoon. Great to have you on board. And Jonathan Barrett, CEO Celsius Pro Australia Proprietary Limited. G'day, Jonathan. Hi, Sally. Great to be here. And again, Susan Bryant is joining us, Financial Advisor, Seeds of Advice. Hi, Sally. Lovely to have you all with us. I'll be back to you in a moment. Farm businesses face many different types of risk, and these vary considerably by type of production and geographic location. Risk is an inherent part of farming and has been long associated with the industry. Irrespective of the size or location of a farm or the commodity it produces or grows, Farmers are called upon every day to make decisions about the risks they face. The value of Australian agriculture production is amongst the most volatile of all large agricultural markets. Factors including significant variations in weather conditions, as well as a relatively high exposure to global commodity prices have resulted in the second largest volatility of, nat of national annual agricultural output. There are many tools that can help mitigate financial and market risks, although their use and application has not always been consistent. Today's panellists are experts in understanding these risks and the possible adverse results that arise from uncertainty and insufficient knowledge in making decisions. Their combined experience and expertise will assist us today in identifying industry-specific risks and the tools available to agribusinesses in mitigating those risks. So due to the ever-changing structure of the agricultural industry, understanding and managing financial and market risks has really become essential for the success of agricultural operations. And to begin today's session, I'd like to welcome our first panellist from the Queensland Rural and Industry Development Authority, Daniel Elder. Now, Daniel at QRider is the manager for the Farm Debt restructure office and he grew up near Chinchilla in the Darling Downs and has more than 15 years experience in the banking sector. And the Farm Debt Restructure Office, which launched in 2018, administers the Farm Business Analysis Assistance Program. It's a free, no, obliga no obligation service and it's designed to assist primary producers experiencing financial difficulties to get back on track with their finances. So very, very important discussion. Great to have you with us, Daniel. Can you begin by explaining to us all what the financial and market risks actually are for the farming industry? Yeah, that's a really big question, Sally. Um, it is. But it's really important. It's to really start the journey of identifying and addressing risks. Um, so if you want to understand financial and market risks well, um, you really need to understand the seasonal and cyclical sequences of your industry. So when I say seasonal, I mean the period it takes you to grow and sell your product. And when I'm talking cyclical, I'm really talking about the longer industry cycles. So those are the ones that encompass multiple growing seasons, but also more of the global um, positions and producers. So, um, you know, we're sort of talking that micro and macro level, but mm -hmm. um, really when you when it comes to Australia, um, we're really dominated by, I suppose, the export nature of our commodities. So, um, you know, that that's actually a big thing there. So what I, re sorry, what I really want to um, sort of look at um, is there's multiple things when it comes to risk. So not only market 
and financial, but also that sovereign and social risk as well, which is sort of coming more into the scene. Um, you know, with, I think you originally mentioned, you know, around that environmental and social governance or ESG. So there's actually a couple of overlays, but really getting back to your initial question, um, when it's financial risk, I'm really focusing on cost of funds. So that might be, you know, what you're borrowing, but also then input costs. So those key drivers and how far these can move before you actually start to lose money in your business. And when I go to market risk, um, it's really about commodity pricing. So I'm really looking at those key influences and again, how far they can move, um, you know, before you're in the red. So um, my feeling is, you know, the biggest risk to your business um, is really the unknown or unmitigated risks. So, you know, these are the ones that you don't see coming or you don't know how long they're going to last. So really, I suppose the simplest way to um, sort of prepare and understand these is, um, you know, by actually knowing your own cash flow. So if you know your income and expenses well, um, you're going to know how much that increase or decrease is going to have on your bottom line. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So basically, that's really it, isn't it? Just knowing. Exactly right. Knowledge is and understanding. Yeah. And how does the farm debt restructure office assist Prime Richard producers, you know, who are experiencing financial difficulties such as this? Yeah, so we um, developed a program called the Farm Business Analysis Assistance Package. So um, it's a free, no obligation report. Um, it's mm -hmm. aimed at understanding their historical activities, um, establish where they currently sit, um, and then understand um, their future capacity too. So um, this is completed by an independent um, third party professional. So someone, you know, that's not, I suppose, familiar and it's new to the, you know, situation. So getting that really good objective look at the business. Um, they look at their prospects of viability and, and really how they get there. Um, but alternatively yeah. to, um, you know, if the you know, business has suffered issues that are pretty extensive, um, they really, you know, they might need to consider reducing or rationalising activities as well. So the process, it it's probably takes about eight to 10 weeks. So, um, which includes an on-farm visit from one of these panel members. So. Um, you know, it really works best if the farmer does have some ideas or direction on where they intend to head. So, you know, you won't get the latest crop advice, but um, mm -hmm. you will sort of draw attention and focus to the major items that, you know, to try and get your enterprise back on track. So, um, and further too, like if the recommendations vary to see how, you know, to how you see things playing out, um, there's no need for concern either because, it, it is free and no obligation. Um, it's really a third party's opinion, you know, to assist your decision making and conversation with, you know, family um, advisors and lenders. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a really good process that, you know, I suppose to get the most out of it, you do need to bring all of these parties into it as well. So yeah. we do have some video case studies online as well, which I probably really encourage people that, you know, ah. if you are interested in it to, to jump on and have a look because um, I suppose it really um, demystifies and simplifies the process. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting thing, but I think in this space too um, is, you know, probably the one of, one of the biggest hurdles we have is language or the narrative around financial difficulty. So it's a bit like mental health, um, you know, and we've been trying to, you know, I suppose, yeah, I ch changed the, the narrative in that space. But um, I think the thing is most people understand the earlier you, you identify an issue, um, generally the more time and capacity you have to fix them. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, this is free, so it's just a great opportunity for farmers to get on board here. And um, So how long does it take them to, you know, if they want to, you know, exercise this opportunity and jump on board and use the farm debt restructure office to help them in this way, does it take long from the first, you know, point of contact to actually getting somebody on farm, for example, to assess? It really depends on the level of information that a producer has. So if they're good at their record keeping, um, you know, they're up to date with their financials and things like that. Um, generally, we just grab the same information they would get at a bank review. Um, but depending on some of the harder cases, you know, we've probably got to try and help out and, and grab a bit extra information that they don't have. Hmm. Oh, it sounds like a no-brainer to me. 
you know, really, it's, it's wonderful, wonderful to have on board. Now, I want to take, talk about um, the RBA increases. How are you finding the interest rates impacting farm businesses? Yeah, look, it's actually been very topical since December. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's not only impact, impacting them, it's impacting everyone. So um, mm. really, I suppose the big question is how long will they stay at these levels? Um, you know, unlike households, farmers probably have the tendency to capitalise, you know, these issues um, mm. in their working capital or overdraft facilities a bit more. So, um, you know, they have a little bit of time to weather um, you know, these cycles out. And I suppose yeah. many producers too have, have done a really good job at repairing their balance sheets over the last three years. So um, they are in a strong place to sort of weather these cycles. So, you know, I suppose similar to drought though, um, it's a bit hard to make beneficial change in the middle of it. So a bit like yeah. with, you know, interest rates, you know, if it's at a high, it's maybe not the time to lock in, but um, you know, it's a bit like forward pricing too. If you lock it in, at least you've got, you know, an income or expense. So, you know, that's probably really important, you know, when you're looking to build a budget, um, you know, with higher accuracy um, and greater focus as well. So you can really control those other variable expenses or, you know, other key decisions with some clarity. Considering locking in, do you mean? Um, yeah, if, if you have a no, if you're locked in and you've got a known cost, well, then you can probably focus on, you know, the other aspects of your enterprise, you know, not doing it as a, I suppose, a money saving or making it exercise. It's really a risk mitigation. Yeah. And can you explain to everybody some of the other services available to primary producers through QRider, for example, or government agencies? Yeah, definitely. Um, QRider is a pretty um, diverse business now, um, though our roots are, are, I suppose, firmly still in that concessional loan and grant space for Queensland farmers. But um, really, I suppose our two traditional focuses have been um, the assistance of new entrants into agriculture, so helping them to buy their first primary production enterprise. Um, and then the second is really, uh, I suppose, helping existing producers become more sustainable through increasing their productivity. Um, Probably a bigger focus now um, is really that drought and disaster space. And, you know, that's a place we've, we've played for a fair while, but the focus has really moved from that reactive to proactive support. So, um, you know, there's now an expanded offer, um, you know, through a number of these um, state and federal agencies, um, you know, to, to try and focus on this and bring new loans and grants um, to this space to prepare people um, prior and then also some in you know emergency activities as well so um, some of these new programs are, are farm management grants um, drought preparedness grants drought ready and recovery finance loans emergency drought assistance loans drought carry on and finance loans so um, they're probably the five major ones um, that you'll be looking at in that space now but the most important part of accessing these um, forms of assistance is by completing a farm business resilience plan. So these plans are really aimed at improving the productivity of your business, um, but also identifying and assessing key risks. Um, and so, you know, a lot of those, like what we're talking about, drought, natural disaster, production, yeah. um, but also identifying opportunities to improve your business and finally, um, the, which is the key is develop strategies and actions to actually um, manage and, you know, mitigate those risks. So you can find um, assistance to complete these plans um, with QFF. Uh, I think a number of the other agencies like um, Growcom and Cane Growers, um, the RFCs and DAF, um, all people capable of helping um, farmers with those plans and QRider then use these um, when assessing their applications for assistance. Okay. Well, you know what, we'll put your link there as well so that if anybody wants to get in contact with you, Daniel, it, they'll be able to sort of ask you directly and, um, you know, if they don't have a question throughout our webinar today, which I haven't seen any there, we've got the link there if anybody's interested. Is that all right with you? Sounds great, Sally. Thanks very much. Thank you. We'll come back to you shortly, though, but I'll, I will move on because time is always of the essence when we do these business hours. But thank you so much, Daniel. Well, now that we have identified some of the main financial and market risks faced by farmers, I'd now like to direct our discussion to 
to risk impact analysis and solutions available to farmers by welcoming our next panelist, Jonathan Barrett, who, as I said before, is the CEO of Celsius Pro. Since 2012, Jonathan has been the CEO of Celsius Pro Australia with a focus on agriculture. He's been involved in the financial markets for the last 35 years, having obtained experience in Australia, London and Hong Kong. And Jonathan has a proficient knowledge in all aspects of OTC derivatives, foreign exchange, commodity futures and equities markets. And it's really great to have you on board with us again. We always love chatting with you, Jonathan. Thanks, Sally. Good to be here. Oh, it's great to have you. So let's start with how important is awareness or more to the point, increasing one's awareness of the value of risk management and the role of financial market products. Sally, I think it's, uh, as we know, it's super important. And I think um, with over 35 years, when you, you look at the trends and what's happened uh, over this period of being in the markets, there's a, an actual standout that really that really hits you. Um, and, and that really is the, the volatile nature of the commodities the volatile nature of inputs, um, and, and more recently, the volatile nature of climate. And, and when you combine all these, the volatility, you know, in trying to produce a crop, any one that could cause, you know, an adverse effect on your income. And, and as you, as, um, as um, Daniel mentioned uh, earlier, also a new one is that cost of money. So yeah. Yeah. in all cases, these are, these are issues that farmers have to grapple with. They, at the beginning of each season, they have to try and work out what are the major major risks and uh, how can I mitigate them to the, the best effect. So a lot is changing, but there is so many more now that farmers have to grapple with in terms of trying to get a successful crop. Mm -hmm. So what about income stability? You know, what are some of the methods that can be employed by primary producers to ensure it? Well, look, I, I think one of the... I think one of the, the when you look at that income stability, it is all about planning. Um, you know, it is all about sort of trying to mitigate some of those risks, but but also trying to understand, you know, if I'm buying insurance, what type of insurance am I actually buying? And, and is it fit for purpose? And I think to me, that's one of the crucial things. Um, with a lot of broad acre farmers, we, we find that they turn around and they say, well, look, you know, um, I've been doing this every year, so I'll continue to do it. Um, but, but, you know, have they actually looked at other forms of insurances? And that goes also to the horticultural people where there aren't a lot of insurances, but there are new types of insurance coming on. And it's all about trying to get your feelers out there to try and work out what is new in the market, what is new with technology, and how can I benefit from it? Yeah, because it's always changing and evolving. Absolutely. And, and I think I think one of the, 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 the important things that I, that I like to say to growers is that you know, something that was around, you know, 10 years ago or five years ago, it's completely different now. Um, you know, it, it's sort of that technology, particularly their technology, you know, when we've got satellite readings, when we've got um, microwave technology, um, you know, all these sorts of changing things. It's all about getting your head around it. And how can I use that technology to benefit um, my, my farm and my production, my yield, and also my uh, income? How can I smooth my income out over years, as we know, you know, a lot of a lot of growers suggest that we've got seven years, a couple of good years, um, you know, a couple of mediocre years, and a couple of disasters. It's those couple of couple of disasters that we really try and need need to cover uh, as best as possible. Yeah, and I'm sure everybody would probably love it if you explained what basis risk is. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think when you when you look at it, um, basis risk is. It's a it's it's an area where you have um, I guess a mismatch between what happens on your farm and what happens at a, at a at a station or weather station, for instance, and and with a lot of some of the new covers, we rely on technology, and basis risk in the weather is all about saying, well, this event happens on your farm, um, is it the same event that happened on the weather station, and and it's that difference between the two which people sum up as basis risk. Now, these days, and a lot of people will argue that basis risk is, is, is still an issue, but these days with greater technology, it isn't. And, and what we like to think is that with that basis risk, ask growers to, to, to look at their income, for instance, what weather has actually caused the effects. Mm. And if they are looking at a new type of cover, uh, which, has base, which doesn't have basis risk, 
we asked them to correlate their data. What happened on the farm is that's what also happened in the policy. So basis risk is something that's very important for farmers to look at, to understand. But once they get an understanding of the tools that can be used, uh, it sort of becomes something that they like. So you're finding it pretty well received or beginning to At the be? moment, um, we, we look at, for instance, the granularity of data. And with yeah. greater technology, we can basically sort of mirror uh, what actually happens on the farm in terms of some forms of data. When it comes down to temperature, when it comes down to, to rainfall, uh, the bomb puts out, for instance, a, uh, a five by five kilometre by five kilometre grid that gives us what the temperature happened on, on, on that grid, also gives us what the rainfall happened on that grid. So it sort of smooths it all out so that you can see what and the past, you can see the, what, what past weather occurred and how that affected your income. And then again, how you can design a policy or an insurance to capture those risks so you can smooth out your income. So important to be on top of this, you know, because we wouldn't have been having this discussion five years ago. Oh, look, and it's, and it's forever changing. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you're 100% right, Sally, and there's new technologies, you know, which, which, are, which are coming to the play. Um, one particular technology which uh, Queensland Farmers Federation is looking at at the moment via the FDF are the hail plates. This is hail insurance for, for horticulture. It's a new form of um, um, insurance that everybody's starting to look at. It requires a piece of hardware that sits in your paddock, and if the hail occurs, you know, it, the reading goes to the satellite, it comes back down to the insurance, and the power wow. occurs. So it's those sorts of technologies which are new, and we're getting a greater understanding. And, and you know, I've got to also thank the Queensland Farmers on the Farmers Federation on that, because they've done a lot of work and actually funding a lot of these trials. Yeah, it's just fabulous, isn't it? And what a great tool to have. And, and so important for everybody to be aware that it's there. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and I think it's the it's like a lot of these, these a lot of farmers we also find, um, you know, are prepared to put themselves out to help trial these products. Um, and, you know, we've got a series of farmers, um, you know, particularly in the pineapple uh, industry, which are, are happy to, to capture what's actually happening and help us sort through these trials. And, and that can only benefit industry by, by having the farmers' support. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, you know, at the end of the conclusion, we will look to have sort of hail covers that uh, growers can rely on. Um, hail is devastating um, and it can certainly wipe out crops and years of income. So these sorts of trials can only benefit everybody. And it's great to see the federations, the farmers all getting together to say, well, look, how can we best benefit industry? And it's through the use and through these trials that we can. Yeah, it's great that they're on board. It's a community effort for sure. Now, can you tell us about some of the insurance and weather certificates you have available for primary producers? Yeah, look, these are a relatively new form of insurances. Mm -hmm. They call mm -hmm. them index insurance. And I think the most important thing here, um, you know, is there are, they're based on the weather, uh, predominantly based on the weather, although you can get it based on subsoil moistures, uh, on wind and solar. But the predominant ones are purely based on precipitation and temperature. And, and they're an index insurance, which basically means that um, if the trigger happens, the payout occurs. So the farmer will come to us and say, well, these are my main risks. You know, it could be the fact that it's a dry season, um, you know, and how can we actually hedge against a dry season? And we would analyze that and have a look at it, create an index that supports what happens on his farm. And we use that, we use probably about 100 years worth of data to do that. And that's all data from the bomb. And we can work out what a decile two and decile one event. And when those events actually occur is when the payouts occur. These types of covers um, are what we call non-indemnity. It basically means once the trigger events occurs, once the trigger occurs, i.e. a decile two event, then a payout starts to occur. And, and to me, that's important because, you know, the covers don't have to be assessed. And the payouts uh, on the covers are normally around 20 to 30 days. And that means that the farmer, when he's faced with a disaster or a drought, or it could be a wet harvest, or it could be a heat wave over, yeah. over anthesis for some crops, um, you know, then he can rely on the fact that he will get that income because everything is fixed before it happens. But if it happens, the payouts occur. Yeah. And in the right time frame as well. And in the right time. And that's important because it, whenever you've, you sort of, 
whenever a farmer is faced with a peril, you know, he wants to be able to get back on his feet very quickly. Yeah. And these types of insurances enable that to say, well, look, you know, um, yes, there's a drought. Yes, I've got a concern here. Um, you know, I've lost 50% of my yield. Um, how can I write that? Well, these sorts of payments come in to help the grower through uh, that next period or that period where he hasn't got any income so he can get back on his feet very quickly. Yeah, very, very important. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. I'll come back to you as well in a moment, but we will move on. Thanks, Sally. You've been waiting very patiently there. And we can see the various strategies that have been developed to cope with these risks and how often farmers may experience the threat of different types at the same time. And based on this, it can be observed that risk reducing strategies are often used in combination with one another because no single strategy can cover all of the risk likely to be encountered. Farmers need to consider the risks simultaneously to develop an integrated approach for better management. They need to recognise the advantages and disadvantages of each risk management option, both individually and in combination. Individual farmers should select an appropriate strategy based on their goals, their attitudes towards risk, as well as their personal and financial situations and to provide us with further information on how best to analyse risk impact and how to find the most appropriate solution to the risks being encountered, I'd now like to finally welcome our final panellist, Susan Bryant, Financial Advisor Seeds of Advice. And Susan is experienced financial planner. Um, she's established her own firm, Seeds of Advice, since 2011. She has over 30 years experience in the financial planning profession, working with hundreds of farming families as well as working in private wealth management with industry-leading private wealth firms. Susan, it's great to have you on board. Before we start, I just have to say personally, congratulations, you are now a grandma. You've got a little boy, little grandson that's coming to the world just this week. I am. Thank you, Sally. It's very <laughs> exciting. <laughs> Let's talk about if you can explain, first of all, how farmers can analyse risk impact in their operations. Well, Sally, I think it's interesting um, just to get a bit of perspective on this. Um, you know, farming farming businesses are a very long-standing part of our um, and, it's, and a significant part of our economy. And in fact, agribusiness is the 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 fastest growing contributor to our GDP. So this stuff is really important. Mm. There's something like uh, thirty five thousand farms in Australia, and ninety nine percent of them are still family owned. So yeah, it might oh, surprise you. Amazing, isn't it? It is, but it might surprise you to know that very few Australian businesses, including farms, actually have an effective risk management strategy. Mm -hmm. um, EY did some inaugural uh, research which showed it was a research covering governance, um, risk and compliance, and, and their survey showed something like 85% of respondents saw an opportunity for their businesses to benefit from improving, you know, the link between risk management and business performance, but few of them actually went ahead and did anything about it. I think um, talking about, you know, analysing it, having a, a solution to, to look at it, um, you could probably you could probably divide that risk into two major buckets, and 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 nicely and neatly, um, both Jonathan and Daniel have talked about those two buckets. One is the financial risk, um, you know, things like the cost of borrowing, um, financing on, on all aspects, managing interest rates, that kind of thing. And the other is the business risk, which is things like production, um, commodity prices, and importantly, from my point of view, the, the personal. So, when, when you start looking at doing some risk analysis, I think, you know, you can do a little circular. There's lots of um, lots of these graphs on, online, a little circular about identifying hazards and risks, and um, then um, documenting known risks, um, documenting then solutions to mitigate those risks, and then having a review plan in place, at least on a, on a regular basis, perhaps at least annually, but depending on what the risk is, it may be more often than that, so that you've got a blueprint to follow. Mm. And um, what you, what is really important, I think, when you're looking at analysing risk and um, and looking for solutions is, is to be able to understand and categorise what the risk is. So some risks, risks have two factors to them. So one factor is, the, is how often they happen. So it might be fairly regular or it might be incredibly rare. And, you know, we've heard a lot about, 
about that lately, you know, these one in 100 year floods, which mm -hmm. keep coming every year, you know. So, <laughs> so you need to analyse how regularly this risk might happen. And then you need to analyse the impact of that risk happening. So it may be a very rare thing, like a one in 100 year flood, but the impact can be fatal, literally in some cases, but certainly terminal to a business. And just because and so it's rare doesn't mean it should be not thought about. No, that's exactly yeah. right. You know, yeah. um, and so you might make up a little matrix that shows how often your risks occur and what the impact of those risks are. And you'll start to see a little pattern of where you really need to be paying attention to things that, that could be terminal both to your business or, or indeed to, to you. Um, so, you know, focus on strategies that are going to manage those really big risks um, you know, things like Jonathan's been talking about, whether um, uh, commodity prices, um, even, you know, interest rates can be huge risks that are out of your control, but you can put some mitigation in place to manage those. But from my point of view, and when I'm dealing with farming families, some, some of the biggest risks that I see are around what I call the four Ds. So the four Ds stand for death, disability, divorce, and increasingly dementia. And each one of these risks can be identified. And each one of these risks can have devastating effects on a family uh, farming enterprise, um, both to the business and to the family indeed. Mm. Um, and so... And some of them can happen suddenly, obviously. Oh, often, yeah. often they do. And yeah. I often say to families, look, these kinds of conversations, you are going to have them at some stage. Um, mm. And it is much better to have them now when the risk is not present and not real than at one o'clock around a hospital bed, which may be the case, you know. So, so you're much better off um, having these discussions when things are not real um, and getting that mitigation plan in place rather than waiting until it strikes. Because um, without mitigating um, solutions in place, you consider the, the death of a strategic person in the business, mm -hmm. the divorce of either first generation or second generation, or even third gener generation for that matter, um, the disability of a, of a strategic person in that farming business, or as I said, the increasing risk nowadays of dementia, because with dementia comes poor decision making. Yeah. And eventually, and quite quickly, it gets to a point where that person can no longer write a will, or do a, an enduring power of attorney, or manage a company or a trust. So you've got major issues with uh, capacity. So that's and it's a large very, part. very stressful for the other family members. Incredibly stressful. And, you know, the last thing you need at a time when you're trying to manage behavioural issues and manage capacity issues and manage the health system is having to manage the bank as well, you know. Um, yeah, and your, they get wind. and your family and your business and your, and your, your suppliers and your markets, you know, it's, it's, it's just dreadful, you know. And I've seen situations where neighbours are circling waiting for something to happen so they can get a bargain, you know. Oh. So you don't want to find yourself in that situation. So, no. you know, there are there are ways that you can analyse and, uh, and come up with solutions for those risks as long as you're aware of them. So, you know, I guess that's the point of today is making people aware of those risks so that we know what we have to deal with. Yeah. Well, Jonathan, have you got anything you'd like to add here? Yeah, look, look I, I tend to, to agree with Susan. I mean, it's you know, I, I often coin a, a phrase, people don't plan to fail, but they fail to plan. And, mm -hmm. and that, that sort of sends it home. You know, like when you do have, um, you know, uh, these events or these outside events occurring, it, it's always good to have a run sheet. What do I do in this case? You know, what, what, what are the steps that I have to follow? And, and rather than coming it from a, an askew when it just happens, it's sort of saying, well, look, at some stage over the last, you know, 50 years or 20 years or 10 years, I've experienced a bad time. It could be drought. It could be, um, you know, a harvest, uh, uh, rainfall at harvest. It could be high temperatures. You know, it, it is all about having that run sheet. Okay, what do I do? Um, how do I plan? It's uh, before the season in a lot of cases. When you sit down and you go through your budgets, it's sort of saying, well, look, you know, um, use technology to your advantage 
And what does that mean? It means saying, well, look, if the bomb says it's going to be dry, chances are it's going to be dry. Um, they might not know how dry it'll be, but it's going to be dry. How long? So therefore, take on some sort of uh, you know policy that, that hedges you for that. So it really is sort of like understanding the new technology. And as Susan says, it's sort of, you know, let's have this run sheet. Um, let's say if it's going to be wet, take covers for wet. If it's going to be dry, take covers for dry. You know, if there's going to be some form of, you know, family problem there uh, of the four Ds, you know, have that run sheet, have it planned. And, and that, that's the sort of thing which, which we like, you know, farmers doing, just be prepared. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and look, Sally, I'd like to add there that... Um, that the most successful outcomes I see whenever a crisis strikes is people who have got a team around them. You know, take advice from professional yeah. advisors. You know, have those people in your corner, have them on your speed dial so you know if something happens, you can ring your insurer, you can you can ring your banker, you can ring your professional advisors, you can ring your financial planner about walking through insurance claims. So you've got a whole team that you can pull in that actually does this for a living and, and use that use that um, resource. Hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I agree with that too because, you know, like where there, where there are a lot of professionals out there that have been in these industries for a long time. Hmm. Um, you know, a problem, problem shared is a problem halved. Um, you know, yeah. we, we often say a lot of the, the successful farmers that we do a lot of business with, each year they, they'll take, they might take one cover on some years they won't take any cover, but yeah. they, they do know it's there. And when they feel it's going to a problem, then they call us up. We provide them with some analysis, as would Susan would do, and I'm sure Daniel would as well. So sort of everyone can get together and provide the right advice so, so that the grower can make the right decision to his balance sheet. Yeah. Yeah, we've also put a link up to to you as well there, Jonathan as well, which um, I think you can see there in the in the chat, which is um, which is great. Okay, back to you again, Susan. So, what are the key benefits, including value and impact, and limitations in assisting farmers to manage financial risk? Uh, look, I think there are really three, possibly four, major aspects that need to be considered when you're managing financial risk. Um, and simply they are um, the availability and cost of credit um, and the repayment schedule, uh, the availability and cost of insurance, um, a farmer's liquidity or ability to generate cash flow, as Daniel was saying. Mm. Um, so holding liquid assets off farm can be a huge benefit in this regard. And banks do like that stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, a, a farmer's ability to maintain an increased capital, um, and again, as I said earlier, not just farm capital, but also personal, protecting, having personal insurance, and there is personal insurance available for all of those four Ds, yep. you know, so they don't just protect assets, which they do very well, but they also protect people, which in turn uh, uh, protects the business and protects the farming. Um, so the other things um, that uh, farmers need to be aware of is um, managing phasing. So when you bring credit in and out of the business, managing contingencies. So mm. again, like Jonathan and I were just talking about having a contingency plan where you've actually gone through a couple of plan A's, plan B's and plan C's. And what if, then we, and what if, then we. And so you've got those contingencies in place um, and that can be underpinned by well-written um, insurance when it's when it's necessary. Mm. And the benefit, of course, and the value of that, it, it's sometimes hard when you when you when you go through good years and people have put a lot of effort into, and, and that's great. I mean, that's that's what you're hoping for. But they are um you know, they don't come around every year, as, as Jonathan was saying, there's this neat little cycle of, you know, good, better, best. Mm. Um, and and so in the years when things are going well, um, it's not uncommon, on, uncommon for business owners to grumble about the cost of contingencies and the cost of insurance and the cost of risk mitigation and also the cost of the time and effort to put that in. And there's a resentment sometimes that... Um, why would you want to pay money um, on risk mitigation when, you know, there are new yards to build or, or there's we need a new truck or we need a new header or, you know, um, we need a new dam? Um, and so it, it's, it's that consistency and that commitment to the long going 
and ongoing sustainability of the business that says every year there will be a place in the budget for that because yeah. nobody sends you a note or a text saying, this is crisis here, I'm outside your front door, you know, I'm on yeah. my way. It just happens. And so I think it's really important to understand that um, when you're working with your lenders and when you're looking at your cash flow and that kind of thing, that you are you have that capacity to say, well, that it, that is a sunk cost. It's going to be part of the budget every year. And every now and then, if we get it right, every now and then we'll have to call on it. But most of the time we won't. But that is just an operational cost to the business. So... Well, there's a value. There's a value placed on peace of mind. Oh, completely, absolutely, absolutely, and and also, and Daniel, I'm sure you you would agree. If you go to your bank, and you have a bank review, and you've got that stuff in place, you know that's a big tick from them. You know, because make no mistake, they're not that concerned about your enterprise. They're more concerned about their enterprise, <laughs> and so. And so they like to see that risk mitigation stuff in place to protect themselves. So, you know, and I could just, if I can also just add something to Susan, your point, um, and Sally, it, it's sort of when people look to budget for, um, you know, for uh, risk mitigation, uh, when they look to budget for insurances, you know, they see it as a just a, a flat cost. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't really realise to say, well, look, okay, this is an insurance that's going to get you out of uh, hot water. You know, some people look at insurance and they say, well, if I take that out over 100 years, am I going to be better off or not worse off? They treat insurance as an investment where it is not an yeah. investment. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, and it's sort of, you look at it and um, an insurance policy, particularly when you are talking about primary producers, it's, it's there to ensure money is there when there is a concern. It's there over years to smooth the volatility of your earnings, um, you know, and it is not an investment. And, and I think that to me is you know, where we have growers and they come to us and they say, well, have a look at this policy. Is it worth my while? And I'll say, no, it isn't. Or yes, it is. Hmm. Within the industry, we all have these tests we do and we categorise it into five areas. And, and it is all designed to reduce volatility and make the insurance fit for purpose. And, and I think that's one of the key things. If you're going well, to spend something, yeah. make sure you're going to spend it wisely. Yeah, that's exactly right. Because you could spend it everywhere, couldn't you? Yeah. But if you don't really fine tune and individualise it, you could be wasting your money. Absolutely. And and, and, and that, that, that drives, I think, everyone a bit crazy because it's not good for the value. It's not good for the industry. Yeah, that's right. And it's just not suitable for you. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, as you said, Susan, if it's in the budget, it's in the budget. There it is. Your it's budget. in the budget. That's right. That's exactly that right. Makes it, that makes it easy to do, makes it doable, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you, is there a relationship between a farmer's comfort with various areas of, of risk and their farming style and business stage? Um, look, yes and no. Um, there's been a little bit of research done on this. Um, uh, there was a bit of research done, um, the RIRDC in 2007, McCarthy and Thompson, did a really interesting paper on this. And um, one of the things that came out of that was um, um, it, it wasn't so much as we might think education and age and, uh, and maturity um, being the biggest inputs, but in fact, having equity in the place was the strongest apparent influence on risk attitude. Um, so risk taking was very strongly correlated with equity levels. And farm profit was a very poor determinant of risk attitude. Um, and um, farming style, farming style, that is, you know, how people go about um, de their decision making in the farming business was also a significant discriminator of risk attitude. So it was really interesting that, um, you know, farmers tended to fall into about half a dozen different groups, which I, I won't go into it just in the interest of time, but but they were you know, from um, quite big risk takers right down to very risk averse um, enterprises. And, and that was the strongest influence was the amount of equity that farmers felt that they had um, in, the, in the business. Um, the three, the three um, I suppose, uh, the, the three, the things that came out of this relationship study as well was that um, 
the farmers that responded that were, that were least comfortable were around commodity price downturns, climate change, and injury and illness. But they were, sorry about my puppy. They were respondents were most comfortable with the risk of a family relationship back breakdown, which I thought was oh really slightly alarming. <laughs> yes, um, frost, fire, and flood, and climate change. Um, so look, this was done in two thousand and seven. So those attitudes may have changed a bit. I'd say they. Um, have shifted a bit yeah yeah like um, time for another yeah and the, the biggest the, the three um most common tools that they use were general farm insurance crop insurance and engaging with a professional advisor um so they these were the things that they went their go-to tools that were the most um common mm. and um and in the future um farmers that responded to this survey and certainly this would be my experience that they, they were most likely to be planning to use in the future succession planning and sharing contents of wills with family, documenting a farm business plan and becoming proactive on farm safety. And that that all of those three things particularly have become um, a much more trending, I would say, in the last 10 years. Mm. So, so the idea um, we're seeing more and more litigation around unsuccessful um, succession planning and um, and subsequently estate planning. So I always encourage the people that I deal with to get, and I have a little black book, uh, to get um, good advice from a specialist estate planning lawyer um, because there are more tips and traps than you can imagine. And your local fellow might be great, but he's not doing it enough to understand all those tips and traps. Um, so a good estate planning lawyer. Um, and again, Daniel, you would agree documenting a family business, farming family business plan is absolutely paramount. You know, if if the main decision maker is suddenly gone, to have a blueprint is just gold, absolute gold. And of course, um, farm safety, because that's become a really hot topic as well, you know, and there's more litigation and governments are getting more involved in that. And, you know, we only have to look at roll bars and quad bikes and things like that to understand the impact that the, that is ha ha having. So, you know, um, the attitudes between farming and and many studies on structural, demographic and behavioural characteristics, um, really the thing that really struck me when I read all this information and when I talked to my own clients is that equity is the thing that has the, the strongest apparent influence on risk attitude, which is really, really interesting. Mm, it is. is. Is there anything you'd like to add here at this stage, Daniel? Um, no, I think we're probably going to be mirroring a lot of each other's comments here. Um, mm. You know, I suppose oh, there's some good. really important parts <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that both um, both have brought up. So, yeah, I might just leave you to it. And I think, um, yeah, I might come in at the end there. Thanks. Oh, well, I do. Yeah, well, I do actually have a rather big question. I've saved this one for last. But um at times, we all know things don't always go to plan. So what are the steps if you fail? I don't know. Who'd like to go first, Susan or Daniel, maybe? Do you want to jump in? Yeah, I, I can definitely jump in there. So I suppose, you know, from my experience and, and the program I run, you know, I expect most plans to not, you know, go as per, um, you know, how you've set them out. So um, you've definitely got to build you know contingency into whatever you're doing into your cash flow into your time so you know and I, I think a big thing is if you don't have the capacity to sort of manage or deal with those changes or variations it's exactly what um jonathan and susan were saying you've got to bring that professional in um you know to review your, your position against your target and then you know try and adjust your plans accordingly so um you know the worst thing is to stick your head in the sand so um, you know, Jonathan said it earlier, um, you know, a burden shared is a burden halved. So the more heads, you know, thinking on the issue, um, yep. the better. So, you know, once it's been socialised, I think, that, you know, generally they become a lot smaller and also the alternatives become a lot clearer and easier to make. Yeah, and it's a lot fairer for everyone too, I think. Would you agree, Susan? Oh, most definitely, most definitely. Um, I think there's um, a number of options I mean, you know, contemplating failure is is never much fun. <laughs> but um, you know, um, and yet a lot of people probably live in fear of 
something. Oh, absolutely. So, Look, it's with you, uh, you know, as, as a business owner myself, it's it's with you every day, you know. Um, and, um, I mean, there are a lot of people in the business world that that say that the only, the only time you learn anything of value is when you fail. Um, and I think I'm done with learning. <laughs> um, but... But you know, Probably if you're all. failing in a family business, family business or farming business, then you know there's a couple of really obvious things you can do. Um, and again, it comes back, as Daniel said, to having a contingency plan. Yep. But reducing debt, selling assets, mm. reconfiguring your business, looking at a changing farming concepts, utilizing off farm wealth—that's what it's there for. Mm. Um, downsizing, um, working with lenders and professional advisors. Um, but you know, before you get to that point. Um, to manage that risk, you know, you need to be looking at things like um, sustainability of your business um, and succession planning has to be an integral part of that. You must always start your business with the end in mind. So having a strong, sustainable business means that you've got a clear exit plan. So that exit plan, the timing of that may not be at your choice, but at least you've got a plan there. Um, diversification, you know, off-farm wealth of any sort, whether it's carbon sequestering or whether it's, you know, um, um, uh, paddock to plate, direct marketing, um, niche niche um, products, whatever you're doing, um, off-farm, building off-farm wealth is going to lower risk. It's mm. not correlated with your core business. Um, and so if the core business does get to a point where you need to draw a line under it, then you've got a few other strings to your bow there as well. And something I'd just like to ask everyone, if you all want to jump in here quickly, just um, some of the tools available to farmers to help them build a resilient farm business, maybe one from each of you that you, that comes to mind. Yeah, so I really think probably, um, you know, perspective, um, I suppose resilience starts with perspective. So information is power. So you really need to get those agronomists, nutritionists, advisors, you know, if you've got a shortfall in your knowledge gap, you need to find someone to plug it. Um, but I suppose I caution that too by, you know, making sure you, you know, you understand, um, you know, that person's background or what they have to gain or whatever else as well. So, you know, it needs to come with um, trust as well in, in all those situations. So, um, you know, they're probably, you know, some of the, the key things there that I'm looking for, you know, when you are, you know, seeking that additional advice in this space. Yep. Good for everyone to know. And Susan? Um, look, I, I think um, I'm going to harp on about my four Ds again. <laughs> Death, divorce, disability and dementia are business and family destroyers. And there is a very, very easy way of managing that. Um, and I absolutely urge anybody um, to see get some good, strong financial advice about that because there are ways to set that up and there are the wrong ways to set that up. Yeah. Um, and I would absolutely exhort people to look at those things because any of those four Ds can be incredibly destructive to wealth and family. Yeah, okay. And Jonathan? Uh, look, I, I think when I think everyone, when everyone's running their businesses and things, I, I, I sort of want to make sure that people do the plan um, and have that run sheet in case something happens. But but I also think it's it's good to try and get value and, and look for value in, in, in what you're spending. You know, there's no point buying an insurance product that, that doesn't add value or it's yeah. too expensive and it hasn't been tested or, or, or tested for smoothing how your, your income or or reducing volatility. So, so I, I think it's uh, looking at that plan, having a little bit of value, looking for value, but also keeping an eye on technology and what technology can can actually uh, provide you with. And, and and to me, I think they're probably the three things that I would, I would think people should be focusing on. Yeah, and that's been consistent with that too, checking in regularly, yeah. not leaving it for five years. Mm. Yeah. All right, well, thank you to you all. Well, based on our discussion today, we can see that financial and market risks are inherent to farming. There are, however, a number of ways to manage these risks with Farmers being able to, with the correct tools, and we've discussed many of them today, either prevent an unfavourable outcome or be able to take actions to reduce the adverse consequences or impact of an unfavourable event. And may we all work towards that. And with this in mind, I just wanted to ask just all of you one little final question, because we love to close with a top tip or a few words of wisdom from each of you. Susan, 
Do you would you like to go first? Uh, yes, I I absolutely believe in the power of uh, professional advice. I've seen what happens without it, uh, and there's a saying in our business: if you think hiring a professional is expensive, wait till you hire an amateur. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good point. Love that. Jonathan? <laughs> uh, just pick up the phone and talk to you if you've got a risk. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, every professional wants to be out there sort of sort of showing what he can offer and how he can offer it. But uh, pick up the phone if you've got a concern. If it's going to be dry for a dry season, then just learn about how you can get dry, dry, dry season insurance. That sort of thing. Pick up the phone and ask a professional. Yep, that, I love it. And by the way, everyone's links are in the chat box as well. And Daniel, finally, what's your word, your words of wisdom or your tip? Um, yeah, I, I mentioned it quickly earlier. You know, I think resilience starts with perspective. So, you know, the more information you can get, the better. Yep, fantastic. Well, I will thank you all again. And I just want to just uh, close off now. But um, just to everybody who's been listening, as I said, the links are all there. If you'd like to get in contact with any of our speakers today and our guest speakers, you're welcome to reach out to them. They'd be happy to get back to you as well. Um, and just to thank you all again, Daniel Elder, Queensland Rural and Industry Development Authority. Thanks, Daniel. Jonathan Barrett, CEO, Celsius Pro Australia Proprietary Limited. And Thanks. Bryant, now grandmother, also financial <laughs> advice, seeds of advice. Bye. Have you with us? And from me, thank you and QFF. Thanks so much for listening. And just before you go, our next business hour webinar is on Wednesday, the 28th of June. It's also at 4 p.m. And we will look at available tools for managing climate risk. So we'll be joined by Karen George, manager uh, for Resilience. Uh, Queensland Fruit and Vegetable Growers, GROCOM, and Stephanie Dixon, Stakeholder Engagement Lead, Bureau of Meteorology. So it's going to be a great discussion as well. We'd love you to join us. But in the meantime, take care of yourselves. And thanks again to our wonderful panellists today. Thank you for listening. I'm Sally Williams, and we'll see you at the next QFF Farm Business Hour. Bye.